he said. And I, I, am, I am normally impervious to these, these types of things, but I'm afraid this time I, I seethed and I thought, you, you rotter. I thought, it's a beautiful day, it's a beautiful park. And the sun is just peeping over the gorgeous London skyline, for much of which I gave planning permission. The swans and the coots are all innocently doing their thing, and you have to go and be so rude. And do we have to put up another sign uh, by the one that says, don't feed the ducks, saying, don't, be, don't shout at the politicians? And, and, and then I, I relaxed, and I, I thought, I thought, what a wonderful country it is that we live in and how privileged I am to be shouted at on my morning run because it shows how minimal is the distance between the government and the government. And if you doubt what I'm saying, then just try to imagine Vladimir Putin, with or without his T-shirt, running around Red Square and being shouted at. And what would they do? Would they, would, would, would they, 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 would they do that? Would they, sh would they shout at they shout at I mean, they wouldn't. They would scatter from his path like pigeons. And what we had there in that admittedly somewhat one-sided exchange was therefore something of incalculable value to this country and to our economy, which is the freedom to say more or less what you like to more or less whomsoever you choose. And as I say this, I'm, I'm conscious that people in Britain today are worried about a sense that they are being muzzled. And of course, people should be vigilant about freedom of speech when we're bowdlerizing Roald Dahl. But nothing and no one is going to stop me reciting the song of the Oompa Loompas about Augustus Gloop, which you all remember. Augustus Gloop, Augustus Gloop, the great big greedy nincompoop. What's wrong with that? It made me weep with laughter as a child. And frankly, I'd be very surprised if anybody at SIS in Vauxhall behaved towards their secretaries as Bond behaved towards uh, money penny, but that doesn't mean we should be banned from reading Fleming's novels. And in all this debate, we should never confuse our feelings of irritation at wokeness or political correctness with the genuine terror inspired by authoritarian systems, where journalists are shot for insulting uh, politicians, where they are not hailed for exposing corruption, but jailed. And we should remember how lucky we are to live in a country and a culture where speech and thought are so free. Because it's those freedoms, freedom of speech, freedom to live your life how you choose, provided you do no harm to others, freedom to love whomsoever you choose, that turn this city, have turned this city and this country into a great magnet for talent. The world's top chefs, at one stage, I think, in London, I used to say when I was mayor, we had more Michelin stars than Paris. So the French were so alarmed by this that they churned out a load of Michelin stars in a kind of North Korean way uh, to overtook us. We have the world's best minds in this country. That's why we have four of the top ten universities in the world. One Cambridge College boasting more Nobel Prizes, I think, than Russia and China combined. Uh, the world's most astonishingly gifted artists and, and musicians and actors. I think at one stage, six of the best-selling songs in the world were written in this country. We have the, have the world's best cultural scene, the world's best museums here in London. The British Museum has more visitors per year than about seven whole EU countries. And I'm in fame for my diplomacy, as you can see. And it is that fantastic concentration of riches in one building that holds up a mirror to all of humanity and tells the story of the evolution of the human spirit. And so, if you give back the Elgin marbles to Greece, then you leave a huge gap in that narrative. And above all, you have no answer in the years ahead to the theoretical claims for restitution from Egypt and Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Turkey, Nigeria, everywhere whose treasures are housed in Bloomsbury. And suddenly, in trying to please the world and correct thinking, you've deprived the world of one of its great treasures and cut some vital panels from its great pageant of human progress. Those gods and heroes came to our country in 1812 as refugees from the Ottoman lime kiln. They were going to be melted down to make cement and they'd become part of our lives. 
We can't send them away any more than we should deport the 40% of Londoners who were born abroad, including me, by the way. Uh, people who come here because they sense that excitement and that freedom and they know that they will not be judged here and they won't feel the lash of prejudice. They know that they will be coming to a safe society where the police will apply the law to everyone, high or low. I used to make a, a joke about how they once arrested Prince Andrew in the shrubbery of Buckingham Palace, which I thought was pretty funny, uh, until they actually fined me for having lunch at my place at the cabinet table in 10 Downing Street. Although I still don't understand the, uh, the rationale behind it. I do understand the key point, that the law is enforced here without fear or favour. And that is the greatest freedom of all. Freedom under the law, because they don't have that everywhere. And it is freedom under the law that enables the political and economic freedom on which we rely. I mean capitalism, the freedom to spend our own money. I mean democracy, freedom to vote for whomsoever we choose. And of course, freedom to kick that person out at the next election. You can have capitalism without democracy, and there are some countries uh, that do well uh, on the soft power index that are coming to that category. And you can even have democracy without capitalism. At least I think you can try. I think democratic socialism is the program uh, for Keir Starmer's Labour Party, though I'm not sure. I don't, I don't want to offend the, the human bollard and wind him up even more than I have done uh, already. Great Sir Crasheruni Snooze Fest, as I call him. Uh, by the way, I just want to just, just, just to point out, uh, purely for, for accuracy, I, when I stepped down, we were only a handful of points uh, behind uh, the Labour Party at that moment, back in July. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just saying that. But if, if you want real success, if you want to be a soft power superpower like the UK, then you need both. You need capitalism and democracy. Democracy matters, because if Putin had been living in a free society with a free media, he would never have made the catastrophic mistake of invading Ukraine. He would never have been so deluded about the true nature of that country. Imagine if we had the BBC, wonderful organisation sponsoring us today, uh, he, he, on his case, let alone Tory backbenchers, instead of listening to a cabal of cronies. He would have known that the Ukrainians are a great and patriotic people and that they would fight for every inch of their land. And if you want a perfect example of why democracy and capitalism need to go together, look at the COVID vaccines. Has it, who, who in this room has been vaccinated? Just about everybody, absolutely everybody. Anybody not been vaccinated? Has any... Oh, there you go, okay. the, 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 a brave self, or, or, or whatever reason chose not to be vaccinated. Fine. But d d can I ask you, as a matter of interest, who, who, had, who had Sputnik? Anybody here have, have Sputnik? Who had, who, no? Who had Sinovac or Sinopharm? Okay. A couple. Okay, well, who had AstraZeneca? I did. Who had AstraZeneca or Pfizer? Like I think, there you go, I, I, AstraZeneca made at, uh, invented in Oxford, room temperature vaccine, licensed around the world. I think it was one of the most beautiful and moving examples of UK soft power I can think of in, in recent years. And uh, it's, an, it's a notable fact that after all the years in which we were told you could have capitalism without democracy, it was the free Western open societies, tend to be the winners in the soft power index, that produced the vaccines that actually work. And by the way, I think everyone should feel free to point this out. Uh, I, was, I, I made this point, uh, this point in Singapore not long ago, and it was felt to be so controversial that the, the organizers actually had to apologize. To, to, and the, the Guardian said, I hope the Guardian's here, the Guardian said my speech was shocking. I just want to check everybody's all right with me saying that. I mean, and then the Guardian, the Guardian is bearing up. At, at the heart of this idea of economic and political freedom is the idea of autonomy, the idea of trusting people and families to make their own decisions, buy own, uh, their own homes, spend their own money, because that autonomy is not only morally right, 
it's the way to allow us all to be as creative and productive as possible and to enjoy and make the best use of the talents we have. And that sense of autonomy for individuals and for, for families has always turned out to be the most innovative and efficient way of running an economy. And what goes for people and for families is also, in my view, true of countries. And you know, here I come to the point that Guy Verhofstadt might not agree with. Because that, in my view, and I'm conscious that this is not necessarily now a universal consensus, not that it ever was, uh, in my view, that was what Brexit was all about. On June the 23rd, 2016, people made a momentous choice. They wanted to be free. They took back control of their money, their borders, and their laws, and they did it against the opposition of the vast majority of the ruling classes in this country and in all the great power centers of our country. What used to be called the establishment, the, the, the bishops, the, the BBC. Yeah? I, mean, I hope I'm not, you know, being too controversial here. The, the CBI. Most readers of the Times, I'm told, uh, were in favor, 70 or 80 percent of the readers of the Times were in favor of Remain. Most MPs, vast majority of members of the of the House of Lords, massively pro-Remain. Remember, I, mean, I, don't, I don't know what the, the balance would be in, the, in, in this distinguished audience, but as soon as that happened, there was a concerted attempt to reverse it, or at least to stop the UK leaving properly. And the Treasury in particular wanted the UK to remain in alignment with the EU legal order. That's why we had all those arguments over the years about the so-called Chequers deal, and many of us uh, rejected that approach out of pure logic. We said there was no point in leaving the EU if you were going to remain locked in the single market. There was no point in being a vassal state. There was no point in being a rule taker. You might as well be in the EU. So for years we fought trench warfare. People like Steve Baker, uh, David Davis, many others were heroic. And as a result, we are out of the customs union and we're out of the single market. But you remember the, the circumstances in which we had to do that deal under the terms of the Ben Burt Act, or as it was called, the so-called Surrender Act. We couldn't leave unless we agreed to the EU's terms. And there was no doubt that we faced a particular problem in Ireland, where we, t we were told that we faced a, a choice. If the, if the UK wanted to come out of the customs union, and the EU internal market. And if we wanted to keep an open border across the island of Ireland, which we emphatically did for the sake of peace on the island and the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, then we would have to make sure that we somehow checked on goods that might go from Great Britain to Northern Ireland and then on into Ireland. And that is what the protocol does. And purely to help the EU, we agreed to check on uh, those goods uh, entering Northern Ireland, as I say, that might go on uh, to Ireland. And I thought those checks would not be onerous, since there isn't actually that much stuff that falls into that category. Most of the goods stay in Northern Ireland. And it's all, it's all my fault. I, 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 I'm fully accepting And the, and the protocol itself, and this is why I signed it, contains lots of reassuring phrases about how Northern Ireland remains in the customs territory of the UK and will benefit from participation in the United Kingdom's independent trade policy. The protocol notes the importance of maintaining the integral part, place of Northern Ireland in the United Kingdom's internal market. But beneath the paint and plaster, there was the cold steel reality of EU control. And the Commission was in charge and not the UK. And contrary to my hopes, they did not apply it sensibly. We had that the mad ban on sausages and potted plants and tractors and heaven knows what, and people unable to send parcels to their grandchildren. We had very serious diversion of trade as British retailers couldn't move goods like shortbread from one, country, uh, from one part of the country 
uh, to the other, even if they didn't actually have stores in, uh, in Ireland itself. And, of course, these everyday frustrations were particularly acute for unionist communities in Northern Ireland, who felt they were being cut off from the rest of the UK, which I, which I bitterly regretted and I felt was absurd because the large majority of Northern Ireland trade is with the rest of the UK. And the problem I had was that there was nothing legally that the UK government could do because we'd given that power away. And that is why we had the bill, to fix it and to sort it out. And we, that is why I believe we had that majority of 80 seats, because I think the people of this country sensed that we needed to fix it. And that bill does fix it. It's still in, the, in Parliament. It does fix all these problems. Uh, it removes any border checks down the Irish Sea. It would allow the, the UK to determine VAT rules in, VAT rules in Northern Ireland, uh, state aid, subsidies, and so on. And above all, it would allow Northern Irish firms to make goods and of any kind, put them on the market in Northern Ireland if they conform to UK standards and not EU standards. So a dual standard regime was envis envisaged. And I don't believe for one moment that it would have necessitated checks north-south, certainly not by the UK. We would not have done anything of the kind. It would have kept and respected the balance of the, the Good Friday Agreement. Now, the EU did not like that bill. Uh, they did not like it because it took away their control and, above all, because it frustrated their key objective by keeping Northern Ireland in the single market for goods. And that made it much more difficult for the UK to diverge and to do things differently because of the strains that would place on the, on the union. And I can tell you that in all my conversations with, uh, with our friends uh, in the EU over the, over the years, it was that idea of, of divergence, that, that whole sort of Singapore on Thames concept, whatever you may think of it, it was that idea of divergence that they feared the UK actually taking advantage of Brexit freedoms so as to be more competitive. And so, in my view, they used the Northern Ireland problem as a way of keeping us more or less where they wanted so that uh, their system, the European Court of Justice and all the rest of it, was still glomped on and, in some important respect, still in charge of part of the UK. And I remember Angela Merkel actually coming up to me at a, at a, a, I think it was a G20 summit, and saying, if you continue with this bill, it will be a Shakespearean tragedy. Well, she turned, she turned out to be right there. Uh, though I leave it to you to work out which tragedy it was. And, and so I was thrilled when, in June, that bill sailed through the House of Commons uh, unamended, uh, I was pleased when the present Prime Minister and his predecessor said uh, that, that they would continue with it. And so when I look at the deal that we have now, I, of course, have, have mixed feelings. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm conscious of, the, uh, of, where the, of where the political momentum is and, and, and people's deep desire just to, to get on. And this has got to be about the people of Northern Ireland, the 1.9 million people, their businesses and their lives. And given that we have got rid of the bill, I can see why so many people are attracted to accepting a compromise. And I agree passionately with Sir Geoffrey Donaldson, for whom I have the highest regard, that the people of Northern Ireland need their assembly and they, they need uh, their government. And it's, look, it's not for me to advise Sir Geoffrey, uh, but I hope that he can find a way of reconciling himself and his party to this outcome, which is the, the fact that we have, and getting back into, into Stormont. But, and I am conscious I'm not going to be thanked for, for saying this, but it's, I think it's my job to, to do so. We must be clear about what is really going on here. 
This is not about the UK taking back control. And although there are easements, this is really a version of the solution that was being offered last year to uh, Liz Truss when she was Foreign Secretary. This is the, the EU graciously unbending to allow us to do what we want in our own country, not by our laws, but by theirs. They're not scrapping hundreds of pages of EU regulations. Uh, they're passing EU law. They're passing new regulations to allow British goods to pass from one part of this country to another, still under EU law, but with what they hope will be lighter bureaucracy. 21 data points on the forms instead of 80 to be completed by trusted traders who can show the EU that they have certain assets and goods for sale in Northern Ireland and to be prominently labelled not for EU among many other provisions and, and restrictions. Look, we've got to hope, we've got to hope that it works and genuinely reduces frictions. I'm particularly concerned that goods going for processing and manufacturing in Northern Ireland from, from Great Britain, goods that are part of a, supply, of a supply chain, seem to be going through the red lane for firms above a certain size, which seems pretty, pretty crazy, not supportive of the UK internal market. And what this will certainly not do is allow goods made in Northern Ireland to be made according to UK standards, unless they're also uh, EU standards for sale in Northern Ireland, or at least it is very, very unclear the extent to which that would be allowed. Uh, it, it's, it's very unclear for foodstuffs, uh, for, for motor manufacturing, uh, and, and all the rest of it. The, the, the EU single market remains paramount. And in that sense, this deal helps to accomplish the key objective that I, that I spoke of. And, and so it acts as a drag anchor on divergence, and which, which, as I say, is the point of Brexit. There's no point in Brexit unless you do things differently. And then beneath the bother and the hassle of these rules, you have to ask yourself the key question. Who votes for the people who decide these rules? Who votes for the people who decide how your pet, dog, or cat can get to Northern Ireland and back? Who votes for the people who make laws about Easter eggs or cakes or boats or any other manufactured goods? Who votes for the people who set VAT rates on sanitary uh, wear in, in Northern Ireland? No one in England or Scotland or Wales and no one in Northern Ireland. And I think there was a reason, as I say, the public voted us an 80-seat majority in 2019. And that was because they instinctively knew that we had to fix this. And that's why we had the bill. And look, um, get on the punchline. Uh, I'm going to find it very difficult to vote for something myself, because uh, something like this myself, because I believed that we should have done something different, uh, no matter how much plaster came off the ceiling in Brussels. And I hope that it will work. And I also hope that if it doesn't work, we will have the guts to deploy that bill again. Because I've no, no doubt at all that that was what brought the EU to, to negotiate, seriously. And in the meantime, I will continue to campaign for, for what I thought of and what I think of as Brexit and the logic of Brexit. Because this is nothing if it is not a Brexit government. And Brexit is nothing if we in this country don't do things differently. And we need to take advantage of it. And we need to be seen to take advantage of it. And let me give you an example. For years, the scientists have been calling for the ability to do something called CRISPR C-R-A-S-P-R, which I'm sure you all know about, genome editing, which for some reason is banned under a ruling of the ECJ. Well, now that we're out, we can theoretically do it. We can, and we're, we're very, we, ha we have the capability to, to do it. Uh, it doesn't mean Franken foods. It doesn't mean we're all going to be attacked by killer tomatoes. It will enable us to do all sorts of things to 
protect crops from, uh, from disease, from frost, from blight and so on. Will we do it? Will the UK be in the lead? Will we dare to diverge? Well, we're standing on the edge of the, of the diving board and it's not clear to me that we, we are going to. And so I say to you, let's take the plunge, even if it would appear that under this deal, those British genome edited tomatoes could not go into the making of a, or whatever, a cheese and tomato sandwich in Northern Ireland, which, as I say, is going to be, I think, is a, 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 is a matter for regret. So let's dare to be different and do things differently. And we should be dare to be different on the economy. I know that COVID cost a fortune, and there was not much we could do about that. But we're out of it now, and there's no point now in just emulating the high-tax, high-spend, low-growth European model. We should think not about raising corporation tax, but cutting corporation tax to Irish levels or lower, and really turbocharging investment to drive levelling up across the whole country, really showing the world what they wanted to see from 2016 onwards, that we are different now because this is a Brexit government or this is nothing. And it's because this is a Brexit government that we got the biggest share of the vote since 1979. Let me give you just some examples of the ways divergence has helped us so far. Yes, it really is the case that it made a difference that we were out of the European Medicines Agency and therefore able to get the first licensed vaccine into the arms of any patient anywhere in the world. And that meant we had the fastest vaccine rollout, and that meant we were able to come out of lockdown faster than the rest of Europe. And we staged, therefore, the fastest economic recovery in the G7, and we had today, in spite of all the difficulties, the lowest unemployment since about 1974, and we will fix our problems, we will fix inflation. I'm no doubt that the government will be successful in what they're doing in getting inflation down. And that was because we dared, that success with vaccines was because we dared to be different. And we dare to be different on AUKUS, which the, I don't believe the Foreign Office would ever have allowed when we were still in the EU. I don't think they would ever have allowed such a rupture with, the, uh, with our French friends and the, and the, the raucous squawkus of the anti-AUKUS caucus. And we dared to be different finally when it came to the great geopolitical crisis that frankly dwarfs everything that we've so far, that I've so far discussed the day in which Andrew uh, Neil mentioned uh, just before I came on. When it was clear that Putin really might be so insane as to attack Ukraine, we were the first major European country to send quantities of lethal weaponry to help them. The end law anti-tank missiles that were so important in the battle for Kiev. And believe me, that would never have happened if we had stayed within the constraints of the so-called common foreign and security policy of the European Union, we would never have dared to be different if we had remained as we were, deferential to the primacy of France and Germany on Ukraine under the so-called Normandy process of 2014. And all I can say is how proud I am that by daring to be different, Brexit Britain has encouraged now the rest of Europe to give arms to the Ukrainians. And we know, of course, that our contribution is nothing compared to their heroism. They are fighting for all of us. They're fighting for Georgia, for Moldova, for the Balts, for, for Poland, as Andrew rightly said, for all the periphery of the old Soviet empire. And yes, on the on soft power. They have the soft power. They have a vibrant, dynamic, free, open society. They have elections that can go either way. And that is what they are defending, and that is what Putin hates and fears. Uh, they have a president who is not only a great war leader, but who was once the voice of Paddington in the Ukraine, of Paddington the Bear in, in the Ukrainian uh, version of the film. So I can say, in the struggle between the Russian bear and Paddington, my money is on Paddington. But sometimes soft power 
needs hard power to defend it, and the Ukrainians need that hard power now. The Ukrainians are fighting for freedom and democracy everywhere. Let us give them what they need and give it to them now. Slava Ukraini, and thank you very much for listening. Shall we um, take the seats over yeah, there? Thank you. <clears throat> So, um, the thought occurred to me, I, I would ask the audience to say, who thinks Brexit was a good idea? Put your hand up. Okay, so we don't have... Yeah, well, we, that, I, I got the feeling that might be the case as we went along. <laughs> but I am undaunted. Has Boris changed want, anyone's mind? I am, I am undaunted. I, I want, look, I mean, anyway... I, I, it, the, kind of the, the problem at the moment, and it's about what we're not getting right now, is uh, any... I, say, I said it several times. This is a Brexit government or it's nothing. We got a massive uh, mandate to change. People wanted a change in their lives. They wanted to see things done differently. And, you know, I've got to put my hands up for this as much as anybody. Uh, we, we haven't done enough yet to, to convince them that it can deliver the change they want to see. And... I think that they're particularly dismayed about things like the small boats crossing the, the channel. But they also don't, they don't feel the, the economic change. And so we've got, we've, got, we've got to break out of the, the model that we're in. Based on what you've just said, you're obviously not going to be supporting the, the Windsor framework. Does well, that mean that you would expect to see... Um, I think people have heard quite a enough division. about the Windsor. I, 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 people keep, they, I've had people... I've had camera crews on, 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 at my, at some my door asking me all, all week what I think about this. You've had about, you've had about half an hour uh, of, of my... Of my you, nobody can say you, you don't know my views on this subject now, or you, 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 you might... You nobody say you haven't heard my views on this subject now. Um, I, what I want... Look, I, it is clear that this is where people are now. And, you know, it's clear from, the, from this room that this is what people... You know, people want to move on. So do you think... They want, be... to, they want to do a deal. They don't want any more ructions. And I get that. I, I totally get that. And I've, I've got to be realistic about so it. So should there be an election? Well, there is going to be an election. We're going to win that election. That's not, for, that's not till, till, till January or, you know, till the end of next year. OK, fine. So um, just going through a few things. We're, we're talking about Ukraine there. Do you think uh, there's more we could do? And is Ukraine going to win? What more can we do? I, I think Ukraine is going to win, but it's going to be very hard. And they, they need the maximum support. They need it now. And my argument is, why delay? You know, if, if we, what happens when, in this conversation? We always end up giving them stuff sooner or later. Well, if it's the choice is between sooner or later, let's give it sooner. You know, we, we, first of all, it was, uh, it was N-laws, then it was HIMARS, then it was, uh, then it was tanks. Uh, now the question is about... Uh, aviation about planes um it's going to happen sooner or later let's do it sooner but do you think it's only going to be resolved militarily or is it yes. is it going to be resolved by negotiation well uh, look uh classically this, uh, people say this is this is this is now uh, tragically a, a a war in which ukraine it's, the ukrainians are fighting and winning this war but they depend on the support of us in in the west and they're the heroes, they're the heroes, but they, they, do need, they, they do need support. We must not fail in giving that support. What America has done has been absolutely spectacular. And I don't think people have, you know, realise the extent of the, of the US support. You know, 45, 50 billion dollars now of, of support for, for Ukraine. This is a massive commitment to transatlantic security uh, by the Americans. I, I do worry a bit that it could, that the atmosphere in Washington could change if Ukraine doesn't win this year. I, I That's what needs to happen. One of the things that was coming across in our research very strongly is that a large chunk of the world yeah. has not got the message and I know. doesn't necessarily support the Ukraine. I know. Well, well, let's just, well, well, we could try that. David, why don't we, why don't we do another... I mean, we, got, we got massive support for Brexit. Uh, let's, let's, let's see... <laughs> 
let's see. I mean, I thought I did pretty well, considering how tough that audience was. I mean, you've got to be real. I had, I had one vote in the audience at the start of the meeting. Uh, <laughs> you know, the selection meeting is good. That was really very tough. Let, what, let's, let, let's just see who, who's, who's, who's basically on the... Who's basically a, a kind of Ukraino skeptic? Who, 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 is a, who, is, who, who thinks that, uh, you know, the, the Russians might have the, the, the grain of a point? Who's willing to say that in a London audience? <laughs> Anybody? I'm not hearing. Okay, right, that's good. That's, that's solid. Okay, well, is this solid what, one what, thing? What comes okay. from our research is that in quite large parts of Africa, yeah. South Asia, you know, North Asia... They're quite sympathetic. And, you know, one of the problems could be that Russia persuades China to come in on their side, give them materials, because they feel, you know, it's the Cold War and they're being picked on. Is there a serious chance you think that might happen? I, look, I, th I think that's absolutely correct. I think that there are large parts of the world uh, where the, it doesn't seem as clear to, to them as it does to, to you, and, you and me. Uh, we feel instinctively this is right and wrong, this is good and evil. Uh, it, nothing could be clearer to me. This is a, a sovereign, independent European country uh, that was invaded in a, a brutal and criminal way. And we should do everything we can to help them protect themselves. But I've got to tell you, that's, that's not how, um, you know, uh, uh, whether it's because they have governments that uh, actually are quite partial to the idea of being able to invade their neighbours uh, when, they, when they choose or whatever. There, there, there are lots of... of um, mixed feelings about this. And I think it's certainly true that Russian and Chinese diplomacy has been very effective. And I think I was eavesdropping on your earlier conversation. We need to do better in getting the messages across. And I think the BBC is fantastically powerful and, and trusted. But I, I got to tell you a tragedy uh, I remember when I, was in, when I was foreign secretary being told that Russia today is at least as influential in some parts of sub-Saharan Africa as the BBC, and Russia today is actually more influential in Latin America than the BBC, um, or more watched, or I don't know about influential, but, but certainly has a bigger, bigger footprint. And that's pretty chilling. I mean, do you this, think was, this, was, this was years ago. So, so people will only respond to the news they consume. And just as you're hearing a lot of bad news about Brexit, um, people, people they're, 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 they're listening to that. And we've got to be smarter in communicating the reality of the situation. So, I, I mean, one of the things that uh, we've heard a lot about recently is the fact that they want to boost uh, defence spending in the UK because of the war. Mm. And they're talking about I don't know, 11, 12, 13 billion pounds. The amount that is actually being spent on the things that promote communication, like the BBC and the mm. British Council, on the other hand, they seem to be cutting it back and back. Uh, and we, we had this discussion last year and the year before, where everyone's saying they think it's crazy that we're not actually putting far more money into all that. I mean, do you have a point of view about that? Well, I, I, the BBC gets a lot of money from the, from the licence uh, pair, as far as I can remember. They, you know, I think the gentleman... And the front row was pointing that out uh, just now. And, you know, that's a, that's a good thing. Uh, it's a fantastic um, emanation of, of British soft power. I've always wondered why the BBC can't make more money itself. With all this cash coming in, why can't they, you know, organisations like Netflix, they seem to make a bob or two. Well, I think, I think... You know, um, what, what, uh, Amazon... BBC uh, Studios. You know, you know what, what, what about all that? Uh, you know, we've got, to, we've got to, you know, I, just, I, I think I said rather extensively in my speech, we've got the most talented uh, media world in, 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 we've got media people in the world here in London. We've got, we've got all sorts of cultural advantage. Why aren't we, why aren't we, why aren't we making better use well, of, our, look, of, our, of our talent? If you look at the BBC finances, they make five billion a year, and I think about 1.6 billion of it comes from media. So the people that are sponsoring us, the BBC Studios, which is the external commercial part of the BBC is making money. Uh, it, it always strikes me as weird that they'll cut back the World Service, which is funded by the Foreign Office. I think they've just scrapped the Arab service, and it's really run on a total shoestring. Well, that's, that's very sad. I think the Arab, you know, the Arab, look, I mean, these, uh, these services 
I tried not to do. Well, I, when I was running, something, I really tried to keep all of that, all of that going, and and uh, and uh, uh, or the, the, as much of the foreign language stuff as we as we possibly could. Um, I think that is that 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 is sad. Um, but I, I just I, I you know restate my point. When I go to the okay, uh, when I go to BBC studios, which I don't do as much as I used to, let me tell you for very reasons which you will know. Uh, <laughs> when I, I'm amazed at the, the contrast between those BBC studios and, um, you know, the, a, a private sector media organisation. And in a BBC studio, and I love the BBC, thank you BBC for sponsoring this conference, you know, etc. Uh, I, I owe everything to the BBC. Um, they launched me, little did they know. Uh, <laughs> um, but when you go to a BBC studio, wherever it is, um, some, some wonderful town or city of this, in this country, it is absolutely spallulating with people in Polonex, uh, you know, doing this, that, or, or, or the other. Uh, loads and loads of people with clipboards, uh, you know, each knowing what their place in the hierarchy is. Um, and, you know, that's not the case in private sector media organisations where the, the cuts and the pressure, uh, the shrinkage of, of advertising has, uh, has been so intense that there's tumbleweed blowing down. Uh, the the, the, these, the, the uh, um, newsrooms of, of some of these great, great, great uh, local papers, and many of them have gone. And many of their business, much of their business, actually cannibalised by the BBC uh, because of the uh, of the way they give they, they give local news as, as well. So um, it's a great, big, wonderful thing. Uh, but I, I think it was I think it was the Director General himself who was overheard the other day saying what a fantastic, uh, there you go, there's one on here, uh, saying, what a fa saying what a fantastic thing it was uh, that they were able to get so much money from the, from the license fee. And it is. Uh, what I'm saying is somebody who has to think about asking people across the country to pay uh, in, a, a, a tax, which they can be jailed for not paying, is, is you know, use that license fee well and, and you know, use it to... to generate lots more income. That's what, I think, that's what I think the BBC could do. It could be the flagship for British media around the world. It could be the great content vehicle for all the private sector uh, uh, in, uh, companies, all the private sector media. It, it, it could be, the, it could be the, 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 the dreadnought that sails the seven seas for the for the for the for the UK and, and gets our message across, but I don't I don't know if it is doing that in the way. Let me just come back to Brexit for a moment. Yes, um, I don't think we've heard enough about that. The, well, yeah, come on. Clearly, um, it I was, gave you about fifteen paragraphs on Brexit. <laughs> no, let, let me ask you this question. I mean, clearly, um, you wanted to get it done. Yeah. Uh, Rishi now thinks he's got it done. When that when and if that goes through, Brexit will be done. So the question then is, well. What but he won't be, but that's the whole point. There's no point in this. That was, what I, that was what I decided. There's no point in this exercise if you don't do things differently. If we are just going to stick in the, in the middle lane and uh, be a kind of, um, you know, relatively high tax, relatively high spend, uh, very heavily regulated, uh, European economy. So, uh, so here's my question. Yeah. What would you do different? I mean, I well, personally, I, I find it very hard to believe that we were going down to 19%, possibly to 17% corporation tax. I know. Ireland sat there on 12%. I was, I, would, I, had, I, my I, finger, I had my fingers I, crossed we'd I, go down to 12 I, I What I would have done, in retrospect, what I wish we'd done, and I spent an awful lot of time uh, with my, my, my friend, the former Chancellor, now Prime Minister, trying to see, you know, see, we need, you know, we, we need to we need to set out our stall about Brexit. And what I wish we had done is put a big um, invest here sign over Britain as soon as we were out of COVID, as soon as it was remotely credible. I think we should have done something. We should have outbid the Irish. We should have said, "This is it. Come here. We will give you tax breaks of a kind." Or you know, so you think we should tax rate I, well, should be ten percent? Or, or, or so, we what it needed was was a big, big sign that things were different and that the UK was the place to come to. 
Because what's so interesting is that uh, I think the, the global audience, when it happened, thought, hmm, that's interesting. What, what, what do the Brits mean by that? What are they going to do? And we had this long, 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 long civil war about what Brexit was. And we never really... But I think we, this... or we haven't yet said we're doing things differently. And that's why. Things like the, the, the genome editing. Get on and do it. Right. You know, but what else? We, we've, got to, we've got to move. What else should we be doing? Well, there's I mean, the, there's are there a, trade deals we should be doing? Are there relationships the, with other countries we should be doing? Of course. Of course. But there, there, are, there are things you should be doing on, uh, on financial services, on, uh, on, on data. Uh, there's a, there is a huge amount that we should be getting on with. And, and I think that... But it seems to me, as someone who did actually vote for Brexit, as you probably gathered, that... Um, right. People no, agreed, I, yeah, agreed with the principle and wanted to see something different. There have been several things that have been different that you just out, outlined, which I don't think you get enough credit for. But as you say, there is no sort of manifesto of things that would make a real difference, starting with tax. I mean, I just don't understand why they have uh, gone for high tax rather than low tax. And I don't really know what the areas are that they could liberalise. Um, no. well, maybe you should set that out slightly stronger and then people yeah. might support you. Well, I, 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 I think that's right, but don't, you know, don't, don't forget, it wasn't a, a, a trivial thing. that We, as I, I said uh, just now, we were, we were able, because we had a different regulatory regime, and it's, you know, people, will, people will dispute this, but it's, if you look at it, it's absolutely true. We were outside the, the European vaccines uh, program. Uh, we were able to do things very, very differently, and we, went, we, we approved a vaccine faster than any other country. Uh, the uh, Medical Health, Health Regulation Agency, the MHRA, was able to approve, I think, both Pfizer and AstraZeneca before anybody else. I'm, gonna, I, I'm, I'm fairly certain of that. And that gave us the, the edge mm -hmm. in, uh, in rolling out that vaccination program. And that was a, a totally massive thing. And, you know, it was a, you know, I would say Brexit saved lives. And, so, and I, 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 would, I, I, I absolutely would. So, and, um, and it, but people find it very difficult to accept that point. They say, oh, well, you know, they, they, because I, I think the, the, the general sort of gloom about the subject has been so, so intense. When you, when you look at, at stuff like the, like the chemicals regulation, uh, the um, uh, financial services, Solvency II, MIFID, all those sorts of things. These are areas where we're now making progress. But I think, and, and Richie definitely wants to make progress on them, but we need to be talking about it more. And I think what we've got to avoid is the idea that we can kind of um, make everybody love us more by, by sort of being more, you know, just not being different. I mean, one of the things I would like to get your view on is that now that we are not in the EU and we can do what we like, there are certain countries or blocks that we might get more friendly with. I mean, is, for example, the Commonwealth the answer? Uh, we're having a session this afternoon. Yes. And how does the Queen's death impact on the relationship with the Commonwealth? Uh, the, the Commonwealth is, is a brilliant institution and, you know, 52 countries that have many of the, of the young people the, of, the, of, the, of the world, the future markets of the world, we should be doing a lot more with it. And I don't think as a, as a country, uh, we, the UK realises what an incredible resource the Commonwealth is for us. And, you know, the, the French and the Germans used to say to me, God, this is fantastic, we had something like this, we would make, we would make much, much more of it. Um, uh, so thinking specifically so, so about... On, on, so I think the, it's a, we need to intensify our Commonwealth cooperation. I, I always felt Commonwealth summits were just too kind of diffuse. There were, there were not enough clear objectives, whether on trade or, or, or whatever. It was, it, was, it was too general. We need to find a way of making the conversation much, much more action. Or, action at, the, at the moment, action the debate about the Commonwealth is, is largely, now that it's King Charles, not, Charles, not Queen Elizabeth, is that going to result in them uh, getting rid of the monarchy and it gradually diluting? No. Or do you see it as something which we can inject more into and if so what i think that the so the 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 monarchy i don't know what anybody else thinks but i think one of the most stunning thing about the sad 
uh, death of Her Majesty the Queen l last year was how seamless, how natural the, the transition seemed. I don't know whether it would be, it was just, I was, I've got to be, I've got to say, I, I, as a politician, as somebody who cares passionately about it all, who was, I, I, I didn't know. I didn't know what would happen. And I remember being in, in, that, in the House of Commons when the, uh, the, the tributes were paid to, to uh, Her Majesty, how absolutely uniform and how heartfelt were the tributes from all benches, not just to the late Queen, but also to the new King, and how emphatic people were in, in their support for the institution. I was really, really taken, even really quite hardened left-wingers on the other benches were, were very, very clear about what they thought and said and meant. You could see that they meant it. And I think that the, the value of the institution was really proved. So um, one of the things we were talking about earlier is the outstanding performance of the UAE. They, yes. they are the country that has done best, seem to be making the most investment in soft in your, in your soft power what, ranking. Yeah, yes. what, what can we learn from them? Uh, have mm. we done things that we should be doing better as a result? Yeah. Well, the UAE, I, I think that it's, a fan, it's an absolutely amazing country. And um, we, the UK, it's like the Commonwealth, we, 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 we have total amnesia. We forget our links. And the, 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 the flag actually only went down in, the, I think, the Trucial States in 1971. And this is, this is a... Uh, a part of the world where, like it or not, the UK is deeply familiar. We should be doing far, far more. And there is a massive opportunity. And um, I've had the, the, a good fortune to have, have a, you know, a, a lot of uh, time with His Royal, His Royal Highness uh, Hamid bin Zayed. I've talked to, uh, to him a lot about what the, the UK and the, and the UAE could do. I think what we can learn from the UAE is... And they have fantastic PR. I mean, the thing they did, the thing that with their space program yep. is pretty good. I'm very keen on our space program, which it's, you know, it's had a bit of a hiccup. And we need to keep going. So I think, I think much more trade. I mean, people don't know about the extent of UAE investment in, right. in the UK. It's massive, but we need to, we need to be... Well, I think a lot of people don't know about the extent of investment by the UAE in lots of things. Aid in Africa space, yes. all manner of different things. But um, yes. just turning to the States for a moment, I mean, now that we are floating away from Europe... Uh, they were not. <laughs> well, OK. <laughs> we're not, I mean... Are we just... I think, I mean, just, so just back on that, on that sort of, that Ukraine point. I genuinely think it is true that we are now more influential in Europe about foreign policy because we're outside it or outside the EU structure than we were when we were in it. Okay. I, I, I genuinely think it was the sight of Brexit Britain doing this thing that helped to galvanise the rest of the... the so thinking the about Europe. our relationship... We're not drifting away from Europe. Thinking and about our relationship with the US, then. Yes. Are we just the 51st state? I mean, Putin says we're a poodle to do whatever they say. Uh, what's going to happen to the relationship with America? Ooh. Well, I, I, you know, I, I would... I, I, Obviously, that's not true because we have a we don't even have a, we don't even yet have a free trade agreement with the uh, with with the, with the United States. Um, uh, that I think it'd be a good thing. I think the I think the UK and the and the US transatlantic relationship has been the great fact of the last hundred and twenty years in in geopolitics. It's worked. It's 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 helped uh, avert disaster in two world wars, and I, I think you can see it working very well. In, in the worst conflict now since the Second World War, uh, as Andrew Neil rightly said. That, and and it, it, we are working hand in glove. I think it would be you know, fair to say that um, there is strong support for the Ukrainians in both right. London and, and Washington. And the result, one, of the, one of the results of what has happened geostrategically is that NATO is very, very greatly strengthened. And that, that institution in which the U.S. has primacy. NATO is the incarnation of U.S. military power in, in Europe. Uh, but it also... It, uh, and the U.K. is the number two. And it, that organisation is now immensely strengthened by what has happened, and you can see that for, 
from, from what uh, Finland and Sweden are doing. But also, I think the arguments now about Ukraine. Are about so Ukraine. we've got a couple of minutes left. I've just got one last question, which is really about, um, you know, 10 years from now, what, what, what's your future? I mean, are you... Um, I think... Uh, I, I think are, are you going to be running for election no, in America? No, 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 no. Well, there, well that's an interesting idea. Uh, no, I, I, had to give up my, I, had to, I had to give up my American citizenship because it was becoming very, very expensive. Um, they're, they're, they're ruthless uh, internal tax uh, uh, department there. Um, I was born in New York. So what's the next big job? Is it head of NATO? What is it? I've done a lot of big jobs. Head of the Commonwealth? I've got a big budget of words I have to write, uh, and I, I, you know, I'm, I'm churning it out. I'm, you know, scribble, scribble, scribble. Um, I, I, you know, I think that um, I, I'm going to... You're returning I'm going to the... get on. The, thing, the things I'm going to say are... I'm gonna, I obviously need to do a, a bigger, a better job of explaining and uh, supporting and defending Brexit and trying to get people to understand. I, I, it is clear from this wonderful meeting, which I thank you, uh, that, that we need to do more on that, uh, right? I, I care deeply about the agenda that this government was elected to, to deliver, which was levelling up. And I do not want us to lose sight of that. The UK is hopelessly imbalanced as an economy. It is quite, quite wrong that so much wealth and productivity should be concentrated in, in London and the South East and a, a huge waste of, of, of human and other capital. We, there, there is a massive opportunity for us to become the richest country in, the, in Europe by, by a long way, if we, if we could level up properly. And I'm going to keep going on that. And the, the last thing is, uh, is Ukraine. Right. And I, I kind of uh, I have a... Um, I was able to build a good, a good relationship with President Zelensky. Um, and you're, that, going to be doing, you're going to be doing more I for get, you. I, I, you know, I, I think it's important to campaign for, for that because I, I, you, you, the point you made, David, earlier was totally right. Too many people around the world don't get it and are, or, or, and are apathetic. And there's also, the, the, there is a risk in, in Washington that um, some elements of the Republican Party will start to go wobbly on it. And there's some sort of crazy stuff. I don't know whether you're, you're seeing this stuff. You know, people start saying that Putin is a conservative. Or, you know, give me a break. Um, that's a disaster. So, so we shouldn't expect you to be returning to the plough in Oxfordshire anytime soon. You're going to no. be talking at large. In, oh, no, in I, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely... I'm de well, you mean the plough, the, the, the pub or the... <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the Cincinnatus <laughs> reference. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm going to be taking... I, 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 I think it's very, very unlikely that, um, you know, I'll, I'll need to do anything big in politics. You know, I've done a lot. Um, I think that, um, I, you know, I need to get on with, with, with you know, trying to... I've got Making money. Big, well, there's, there's that. But I've got big deadlines. I've got big deadlines and, and pages and pages to write. I, I think you should take notes from... Uh... <laughs> Let's see. He'll show, you, he'll show you how to uh, do the social media. Is that right? I, well, I know. I, we, we all need to learn. We all need to anyway, learn. thank you for your time. We've thank slightly you, overrun. Thank you very much, and, David. Uh, it was thank great. you all for listening. Thank, thank you all for listening. And lunch is now served upstairs. Thank you. Thank you very much.